a Canadian Radio Sanctuary podcast. When did your uh, tour start? When did it start? Mm-hmm. You got me there. Uh, I haven't looked at the itinerary yet. Uh, sometime next week. Oh, I see. It's not underway right now, then. No, no. I'm, I've got to go up to San Francisco at the weekend, and then we come back for a couple of days, and then we take off after that. And I, uh, I just got in from a vacation in in France, so uh, I haven't had a chance to look at anything yet. Mm-hmm. Where is home now? Where do you reside? Hollywood. Oh, you do? Mm. Oh, I see. I know there's so many uh, British performers over the years have gone back and forth, and uh, do you ever get back to England that often? Yeah, I was, ju- I was there two days ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just passing through London and trying to check out the possibility of a tour there in uh, October, November. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us about the n- new band that you have assembled? Are there any people you've worked with in the past? Um, no, they're all new to me, and uh, they're all session faces who reside in and around Hollywood. Um, Red Young, the uh, keyboard player, is like players with people like Dolly Pond and people like that, you know? Um, mm-hmm. Kind of like leans more towards rock deep down inside of his heart. And uh, I, I guess that, that's what he likes about the band. And I have another keyboard player, Skip Van Winkle, and he's uh, uh, well known in, in session circuits here in town. Mm-hmm. Uh, Terry Wilson, the bass player, is about the only guy that I'd, I'd known before this band because he was in a previous band with me and I, I knew him from England. He was in Backstreet Crawler in England. Mm-hmm. And uh, the guitar player, Don Evans, <coughs> came to me through uh, connections via my sound man. And uh, he's from originally from New Jersey. The rest of the guys are still as uh, Texas and Oklahoma. Oh, I see. I just wanted to say, I know it's uh, five years ago now, but I always wanted to compliment you on the uh, Animals Reunion album before we were so rudely interrupted. It was one of my favorite albums, in fact. Was that a lot of fun to do? Um, it was interesting. Uh-huh. Uh, it, it allowed me uh, the chance to understand the first time in all the years that I've been with the Animals. It allowed me a chance to understand how the sound that we had came about. I could see it uh, being sort of formed uh, mechanically, um, mathematically, you know. Instead of just being raw motion, I could see how it came together. Mm -hmm. What made it happen? That's That's what was interesting about that session. There was a definite sound, too, in the early animal days when Alan Price was playing, and then later on, um, have you worked that much with Alan uh, at all before 77 when you did the reunion album and after, or was it just this one shot that you did this? You mean did, did we work together before the session? Yeah. No, we just met on a Monday morning, sat down and said, what do we want to do, and did it. Oh, I see. <laughs> that's, that's the way we always worked. Uh-huh. I mean, uh, it was unheard of for the animals to rehearse, and we never did. Um, we just played and, and and that attitude is still with me today, which I get I get shocked looks from people when I say rehearse. What what do you want to rehearse for? You know. <laughs> and uh, I got to go to rehearsal in a few minutes. Actually, I mean, like, and it's a, it's a it's a drag. I hate it, you know. But I mean, <clears throat> you have to do it these days. I mean, uh-huh. because the musicians are coming from such different areas, mm-hmm. different age groups. You know that everything now now everything has to be. Not everything has to be sorted out up front, but at least certain areas and certain points have to be uh, allocated before we uh, begin to musically converse. You know. I think that's one of the criticisms a lot of us have of new music, in, in that it is too polished, too perfect. It's nice to hear some of those old Sun records when it was just one take. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, m- <clears throat> basically, my guys believe in that, and... Uh, um, I always give musicians room to play. Probably too much. I get criticism too much sometimes. But, uh, but there's a nice balance in this band between uh, the feel, um, most 
definitely their off stage attitude is great they're great to be with mm-hmm. um and they're 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 aggressive their aggress- aggression is there but they're, they're real gentlemen i mean uh, to play with and uh, everybody listens to everybody else and we have the element deliberate element of the a B3 organ which sounds like the old Alan Price sound mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but uh, Skip plays much more sophisticated uh, organ than Alan did oh, well, I don't know but if sophisticated is the right word it's just a different technique mm-hmm. but the sound has is reminiscent of the old animals so it's kind of like uh, and plus I have a, a Red Young as the other keyboard player and he's playing a lot of synth and uh, acoustic piano. So there's a, there's a melting there of two keyboard styles, one being reminiscent of the old animals and the other one putting us into, into a newer area, you know, sound-wise. Mm-hmm. Do you do a number of animal songs in your show, then? Yeah, uh, I'm, uh, I have to uh, at the moment. It's, it's a necessity at the moment because the band's so new and we haven't had a a chance to breathe yet and and relax and and think about writing new new things. Um, there are there's many ideas flying around and we've started demo work as of yesterday uh, when I returned from holiday. But with a new band, you know, it's like meeting new people. You've got to you've got to sit down and talk ab- about things that you're both fam- they're all familiar with. You're both familiar with. Mm-hmm. Well, I'd start a conversation. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, that's, uh, if you were to sit down with a stranger in a pub and, st- and, and you hadn't talked to him before, I mean, you might first of all talk about soccer and then from soccer get into something else, yeah. So the soccer in this case is, is my, uh, my old catalog, which the guys are either A, familiar with already, most of them are familiar familiar with it, so therefore they can pass it on quickly to the rest of the band. And um, I feel quite at home uh, singing those songs because I'm familiar with them, so that puts me in a comfortable position. Mm-hmm. And we can look for new areas to go to in terms of arrangement every night. It's just a process of getting to know each other before we uh, stretch out and say something new, mm-hmm. which uh, should be just around the corner. I don't know how you hear it, in your mind when you listen to your old material but one advantage i think you have doing some of the older stuff still is it doesn't really sound old i think there's a very contemporary sound to what of what the animals did and even what you did in the later 60s as well that holds up today at least to yeah i I think yeah yeah, i think you're right and i and i um i'm very lucky i think and on that level is the fact that the songs that i that i was doing Back then, uh, a lot of times they were out of time. They were before that time, mm-hmm. and I find that now they're even more relevant today than they were then. Mm-hmm. Certain songs, mm-hmm. but there are certain songs that are that I flatly refuse to sing because they have no relevance whatsoever to to uh, to today. That's right. And I can't believe in them, so therefore I don't sing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, show wise, if I was doing a show and I was involved in show business we're off to San Francisco this weekend and I should be doing uh, San Francisco nights I mean I could walk on stage and slay people with that song even if we played it badly it would be the obvious thing to do mm-hmm. but that ain't San Francisco anymore no and that San Francisco doesn't exist anymore so therefore I can't walk out there with any degree of um, honesty and, and sing that song mm-hmm. Monterey would fit in there too wouldn't it I think, no, I think Monterey is relevant because, first of all, it's quite a complicated arrangement to play. There's a lot to remember, and it's a good groove. Mm -hmm. And historically, it points to an area, a particular area, which you you can define as the one afternoon that happened Mm -hmm. way back then. And it's super... It super tunes me in the memories. So I've been thinking of doing that. We don't do it as yet, by the way, but I've, I've been thinking of doing it. Um, mm-hmm. But things like, uh, we got to get out of this place, and it's it's my life who just sort of, for me,
me uh, say what must have, must have had to have been said then, before then, and most certainly now. Mm -hmm. Are you a big fan of the songwriters Lieber and Stoller? Because you've done some of their numbers. Uh, sure. Uh, in fact, I haven't done as many of their songs as I'd like to. One of the biggest reasons for me wanting to get out of the business, which I have done for several times, I've thought of just making an exit and doing something else. Um, the reasons for keeping me in the business are, is that I come across good musicians that make me want to stay there and a newfound audience. But the, reason, the reasons that make me want to run is the fact that during the 70s, after the 60s was over, during the 70s, the, the business changed and became more oriented towards singer, songwriter, publisher, lawyer, record company setups so that everybody could get the maximum out of the act. Mm -hmm. You follow me? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the, the pure singer was, was phased out because the, the, the singer is a purist. He should be able to, and he should want to, sing anything that appeals to his uh, ear, inner ear, mm -hmm. and say, wow, yeah, I could really do something with that. Yeah. Which, uh, up in, before, prior to the 70s, around the 70s, that was the case. A guy like Elvis Presley or Frank Sinatra or anybody would sing whatever they wanted to sing. Mm -hmm. There wasn't any strings attached as to what you should say or sing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when you say, "Am I am I a fan of Lieber Straw?" For sure, and I and I look upon their well of work and uh, Ray Charles's uh, well of writing and uh, Chuck Berry. I mean, ch take Chuck Berry for instance. People think that they've heard Chuck Berry. Everybody thinks that Chuck Berry is like played out, that every rock and roll band in the world plays Chuck Berry songs. This is not true. Chuck Berry has written some songs that, peop that people haven't touched on, except for the man himself when he recorded them. And they're wonderful songs. Beautiful songs. And uh, th there are so many writers like that, and so many performers like that, that uh, I admire and, and would like to... Uh, it was, it's interesting you should say that, because... Uh, on Dave Edmonds' new album, he does Dear Dad, which is a great song. Oh, yeah. Chuck Berry's song, yeah. yeah sure. Yeah. Sure. Funny you should say that. We did, uh, we jammed it, uh, jammed on a Dave Edmonds lick last night. And it wasn't his song, God, who, I think Frank Domino originally wrote it. Um, keep it knocking. Oh, yeah, I hear you knocking. I hear you knocking. Mm hmm. Uh, we did it for a giggle and it turned out great. We had a good time doing it. So, uh, you know, it's, the, it's just a groove. I mean, a groo if a groove turns you on, there's no reason in the world why you shouldn't do it because that's all it is, is uh, providing a uh, groove for the people to get up on. That's right. So whatever feels, what whatever about fits where, you know, I mean, if the shoe fits where, is that the expression? That's right, yeah. <laughs> Are you planning to record soon? Uh, uh, yeah. Um, I'm in just beginning the process of uh, getting the material together for, for a new album. Mm hmm Back in the late 60s, I just want to touch on this because there are many of us who have followed you over the years, and, and uh, there's a vague area for many of us, and that is when the late 60s happened and you were Eric Burden and the Animals, how did your affiliation with what became war happen? How did that come about? How did you meet the people in war? And um, I took a vacation from, from the business around... 70, uh, 60, 60, uh, uh rum decade. <laughs> the 869, I finished with the new animals. Mm -hmm. And things were so loose then, there wasn't, there wasn't a band break up. We just sort of like said, we're in California, we want to stop, we're going to stay here. And um, I was kicking around doing nothing, and uh, I went to the Monterey Festival, that was, yeah, the Monterey Festival was one of the last gigs we did, 
when I was up at the Monterey Festival, I ran into uh, Jerry Goldstein, who I later met in Los Angeles. And I wasn't, I wasn't working. I was just kicking back, having a good time. And he asked me if uh, I felt like getting involved in music again. And uh, I said, well, it is interesting. And his idea was to uh, show me a band in the valley, uh, over in the San Fernando Valley, called The Night Shift. And they were um, a typical uh, black nightclub act, playing sort of uh, everything from James Brown classical covers to recent uh, white covers, you know. Mm -hmm. They were playing everything and anything. And the band was massive. It had a huge horn section and three, four girl singers and things like that. So uh, at first I didn't think it was what I was looking for, but um, I was particularly attracted by the sax player and the rhythm section were exciting. So he asked me what I thought, and I, and I told him that if, um, if we got rid of uh, certain members of the band and we chopped it, just like the Harley Davidson, if we took it and chopped it a bit, it might run like a decent machine. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what we did. And then there was this harmonica player hanging around in town, Lee Oscar, who used to always be jamming at a club called The Experience you know, on Sunset Boulevard. And we used to jam with everybody every night there, just for the hell of it. And uh, I liked Lee a lot, so uh, I figured I'd insert him into the band. And uh, consequently, the horn section in war became the mixture of harmonica and tenor sax, mm -hmm. which was really uh, new. It was a new thing for me, anyway. And it, 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 so it sounded kind of nice. You know? And that's how we got together. Mm -hmm. We went out touring and uh, got a record deal and that was it. Did the dream and spill the wine ever happen for you? <laughs> yeah. Did it? Yeah. 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 Except uh, it was more of a nightmare than a dream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, making movies can be that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, parts of it were dreamlike, but film is so critical, you can't say, well, we all, it's like saying, it's like the people who say, we lost the war by the skin of our teeth, you know. Mm -hmm. You can't lose a war that, that close. You either win or you lose, you know. And um, that's why I love movies. You can't scam people. They either sit there and they are enthralled by what they see, or after 10 minutes their ass begins to hurt. <laughs> and what happened with my movie was uh, it lost the war by the skin of its teeth. There are moments that, that make it, but the end, in the end, the thing is, is that the director had one movie in mind and I had another movie in mind. But it was a good experience for me because I learned a lot from it. Not particularly a lot, but I learned the little things that I learned are uh, most important to, uh, to, uh, to me. Mm -hmm. And it just made me hungry. I want to get involved in more. So. More home cooking. <laughs> okay, Eric, thank you very much. I'll let you go, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing you in Vancouver next week. Okay. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye.